everybody, my name is Jackie. I'm on the communications team here. And I'm with Dr. Joe. He is our senior veterinarian and he's going to take us on a tour of our vet clinic. But first... Good morning. I'm Dr. Joe Flanagan. I've been at the Houston Zoo for 37 years. Um, we're going to start here. Um, our sea turtle facility in Galveston has sent us up a few sea turtles today and that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. So we're going to go into the one of the buildings of the zoo hospital complex is just the building where we do most of, we call it the service building. It's where we have our x-ray. We have two x-ray suites. We have um, let's, um, two x-ray suites. We have two treatment rooms. Um, we've got a surgery room and a lab in this building. And this is where we really take care of all of the animals at the Houston Zoo. Um, not every animal can come into the building with us, um, but we take take it on the road when we need to, like we'll go over to elephants or rhinos and work on those large animals there. But most of the animals do come up to the hospital for medical exams on a regular basis. So Dr. Joe, you said you've been at the zoo for a very long time. How did you get to become a veterinarian? So I am a super lucky person. I went to a really good high school. I had a um, very good undergrad at Iowa State University and I got into vet school um, back in the late 70s and was fortunate then to have some training in zoo medicine at the Omaha Zoo and then I, I was mentored by Dr. Harwell who hired me here in December of 82. And since then I have been learning from all of the people who work at the zoo and have a great team of associates. There's five veterinarians total, four technicians, four zookeepers that just work in the zoo hospital. We have some administrative staff here and we also take care of pest control. So we've got all of the bases covered seven days a week, 365 days a year. And you have a particular affinity for sea turtles. I like all animals, but I have definitely a preference for working with reptiles and especially turtles and tortoises. Um, and so lucky here because, you know, as we were told years ago, um, think global, act local. We are lucky in that we can act local with conserving sea turtles and it has a global impact. Um, I am lucky I get to work medically on turtles, but everybody can help save turtles in the wild by making smart choices, by reducing their use of plastic, recycling when they have to have it, um, making sure that they don't drive on the beach, make sure that they are conscientious about chemical use and not dumping oil down their drain. There's just a thousand things that we can all do to be good um, custodians of our wildlife resources. Not only sea turtles, but birds, mammals, everything. Well, let's go in and see the clinic and see what's okay. here. Like I say, this is our service building, and I will head on through. This is the main hallway that connects the service side. We've got a radiology room on each side of here. We've got exam rooms on either side. We're going to go into our radiology room where Dr. Merrow and uh, our technician, Jennifer Atkinson, are working on a sea turtle that was brought to us today by Andy Krause, who is one of our sea turtle hospital keepers. Um, this turtle that we're going to look at today is a green sea turtle. It's stranded in Freeport, Texas. A member of the public um, called the turtle in, called a number which is operated by the state wide network for sea turtle cooperation. Um, which is 1-866-TURTLE-5. When somebody calls that number, no matter where they are in Texas, they get routed to a phone tree. And the ones that come from the upper Texas coast go to Andy or his sidekick, Cody. Um, and then they'll go pick up turtles to bring them into the turtle hospital. Um, Dr. Joe, how do I know it's a green sea turtle? It doesn't look green. Well, the green sea turtles actually got their name as green because people used to eat them and the fat inside is green because of all the, um, the algae and sea grasses that they eat. Now we need to step back um, because we're about to take an x-ray and we want to make sure that we don't get any unneeded exposure to radiographs. So Jennifer is working with the turtle, getting it to be calm. It can be very difficult to get a green sea turtle to stay still long enough to take a good x-ray. Um, but how do you know that it's a green sea turtle without looking at a screen fat? 
Um, there um, are seven different types of sea turtles in the world. We have five of them on the Texas um, near shore waters. Leatherbacks, which we, we don't really see live leatherbacks in our area. Um, they sometimes wash in dead. The next large turtle that we see is the loggerhead, and they've got a very large head, and uh, they're kind of a reddish, orangish color. Um, green turtles are another very large species. These are commonly, in our area, they're, they're generally small like this because they are in juvenile habitat, eating the grasses, sea grasses in West Bay of Galveston. Um, they eat the algae and the rocks um, on the jetties. So Emma wants to know if they swim fast or slow. So yes, they swim fast and they swim slow. The, um, when they're threatened by something, these guys can take off like a bullet, but generally when they're feeding or just swimming um, leisurely, and a person swimming or snorkeling can easily keep up with them and watch them. I've been lucky enough to be able to watch them in uh, the waters in the Galapagos and in Hawaii and snorkeled alongside them for, for a long time. Charlene asks, how long are the sea turtles? Um, I'm not sure I understand what that, so its length, this turtle is about 30 centimeters long, which is converting to inches. Um, let's see. 10, 12 inches, about, maybe a little more, 14 inches. Um, they will get to be um, 400 to 450 pounds, and probably four feet in shell. And we are back out again yeah. so that we can get, no, normally when we take x-rays of a sea turtle, we wanna get, we start with the dorsal ventral view, which is from the back to the belly. And that gives us an overall projection of what the lungs look like from above. Then we take a side view, um, which is what we're setting up to do now, so we can see what's happening there. Um, and then we'll take a view from the front to the back, and that gives us three views to help us identify if there's any pneumonia or any kind of problem with their lungs. So Amanda has asked, are they endangered? Yes, all sea turtles are endangered or threatened, depending on where they are. Um, in Texas waters, green turtles have just really started to come back from probably the protections and the actions that people are already taking with uh, conserving turtles and, and being careful with beaches um, and their plastics and their waste. And the fact that we're, um, our bays are healthier. There's, there's better sea grasses available for green turtles. We see a lot of uh, Kemp's Ridley's because of the protection that's happening in South Padre and in Mexico. The um, numbers that are being seen all across Texas have gone up, um, and especially with green turtles and Kemp's Ridley's, but we see loggerheads and um, hawksbills. Um, I want to know, how did this particular sea turtle come to us for help? So this turtle was stranded in Freeport, Texas, um, a little over a month ago, and people called the 1-866-TURTLE-5 number, and they call that, and the numbers on the Upper Texas Coast get routed to Galveston facility, our, our sea turtle hospital in Galveston. We have a couple guys that work in that facility, and they will go pick up turtles on the beach, bring them into the hospital, they inform us right away, and if an animal needs immediate care, we either arrange for the turtle to come to the Houston Zoo for treatment, or one of us will run down there to take a look at it. Today, um, so this turtle came in, like I say, a little over a month ago, and we took x-rays and we did blood work and, and an exam, and what we learned from that was that the turtle had signs of pneumonia. He was skinny, um, he hadn't been eating very well, and that's not uncommon in late winter for us to see turtles because in the winter their immune system dies back a little bit and they're not as able to fight off infection. So um, what we're doing to intervene is we give them really good care, nice warm water, nutritious food, and we put them on some medicines that will help fight the fungus and possible bacterial infection in the lungs. Do we and know if this is a boy or a girl turtle? We don't know. Um, sea turtles um, don't show whether they're male or female until they are 
almost adult size. And uh, let's go, let's skip on and talk about what Dr. Marrow is doing right now. This turtle, um, Andy noticed and reported yesterday that this turtle has been squinting a lot and blinking excessively with both eyes, and that's not a normal finding. Most of the time our turtles don't seem to have irritated eyes. So we wanted to do a quick ophthalmic exam on it. Um, and Dr. Mara was using what we call a slit lamp, which is a really neat instrument that helps us see very clearly in the front part of the eye and the iris. And so you can see if there's infection or inflammation. You can see if there's a cataract or um, any trauma to the cornea. Um, it's, it's an awesome tool, uh, way better than in the, uh, the old sort of ophthalmoscope that we used to use. I don't know if you've got any observations, Dr. Mero. So far, everything is looking very normal. We're gonna move on to testing the intraocular pressure next. What is intraocular pressure, Dr. Joe? So intraocular pressures are, um, our eyes have fluid in them, the, the ocular fluids, um, and they're based, the pressure, um, it keeps the eye round or round shaped so that we have good optics. And if you've got a high blood pressure problem or a blockage or inflammation, sometimes the, blood, the, the pressure goes high. So we wanna measure that. Um, and there's a, this is the same type of device that's used on people to measure. And what we're looking for is something like glaucoma. So if it's uh, too high, it would be glaucoma. What would that mean for the turtle if it was found to have glaucoma? Um, I have never heard of glaucoma in a turtle, but it could alter its ability to see, it could make it blind, and if it um, is a condition that can't be medically cured, then it would be probably unlikely to survive in the wild. If we find it, we will certainly look for uh, therapy. If necessary, we actually have a veterinary ophthalmologist that consults with us at the zoo, and he is always eager to provide input, um, especially with reptiles, because he is another person who, um, although he's a great veterinarian and a great ophthalmologist, he's also very interested in reptiles and amphibians and saving them in the wild. So this turtle, um, again, didn't have this problem, and we were suspicious that maybe it's, it's something in his tank. The water is crystal clear, everything is good. We're not seeing anything that we should identify as a problem. Um, so. What is she doing? What is Dr. Mero doing right now? Right now, Dr. Mero is staining the eye. And so you can't see a scratch on the cornea with your naked eye. Sometimes they're so small and so faint that you really can't see them. So if you put a little uh, fluorescein stain, which actually is sort of glow in the dark um, stain, and then you flush it out, all the fluorescein should go away if the eye is healthy, and there's no tear or ulcer in the cornea. But if there is any kind of compromise to the surface of that cornea, then those fluorescein will stay, and so there'll be a little patch of green or a stripe of green in the eye. So he's making a little bit of puffing sound, what does that mean? Um, that's just because their um, trachea is generally not that big around and whenever they move air in and out fast, it causes that little kind of wheezy sound, like, like me after I run a couple of blocks. <laughs> now, while she's still doing this part, we'll tell us what they eat. So, green sea turtles, again, eat uh, mostly vegetation, um, sea grasses and algae. When they're juveniles, after they leave the beach, they um, they go off, uh, they hatch, they go off to the middle of the ocean or, or out into the deep sea, um, and they get into sargassum beds. There, as newborns and hatchlings, they, they're they a much more omnivorous animal. They eat shrimp and squid and slugs and invertebrates of all kinds that are in the sargassum. As they grow on that, they, um, they start to move towards the shore to get more seagrasses and that type of thing. So when, this is, Andy, what would you say, about a five to seven year old green turtle? Yeah, it could be anywhere. So it would have just probably come 
to the coast for the first time probably last summer, and, and before that it would have been out in the Gulf of Mexico in the Sargassum. So. so Dr. Joe, we're not seeing anything on the eye exam, um, no stain uptake, so no ulceration of the eyes, um, no issues with increased intraocular pressure in pressure inside the eye, and um, we're not seeing any outside abnormalities. These guys have very, very tiny pupils. They're meant to see in deep, dark waters, and so in normal light like we have here, even though we've turned the lights down a bit, it can be a little bit hard to see all the way into the back of the eye. So if we're going to look at that um, at a later date, we would have to probably dilate the eye in, in order to look at the back of the retina. And we probably don't need to do that at this point, but if it continues, we'll make sure that we check with our ophthalmologist because they have a very nice camera from getting really nice pictures at the back of the eye. And it's really hard to dilate reptile eyes because they have different kind of musculature in their iris. And so it doesn't dilate the same as a mammal eye does with the same medication. So it's a little bit trickier to do. Dr. Joe, I know you have some of the x-rays pulled up. Yeah, Shall we, we go, go check out that? Thank you so much. We'll take a look at some of these x-rays. Um, and finishing on your question about how do you know what sex the animal is. So we don't know until they get close to adult size, and for a green turtle that would mean he's got to be close to probably three feet long, and this guy has a long way to go. But one of the interesting things about turtles, so many interesting things about turtles, uh, but one of them is that most of them, the gender of the baby is determined by the incubation temperature of the eggs in the nest. So hot babes, cool dudes, is the way I remember it. So their incubation is at about 28.5 Celsius, which is in the mid 80s, 86. A little warmer, hot babes, makes more females. A little cooler, cool dudes, makes more males. And that works with many species of, of turtle. With crocodilians, it's the exact opposite. What do we have here? So what we have here is a radiograph of this green turtle. And I'm not sure why it's blinking the way it is, but it, um, on here we're seeing these. So this is, these are the flippers, obviously. This is the head and neck. Something is missed, weird, here. Um, the sea turtle spine um, is more or less joined to the carapace. Um, and the, the ribs essentially are, are bound on the shell. So the shell itself is made up of fused ribs. Um, and then there's the plastron, which is the lower shell, and these are these little projections out here. It's not a solid um, case like a lot of the turtles and tortoises. Sea turtles are a lot more flexible, but they do have bone in both the top and bottom shell. So we're looking mostly at the lungs on this guy, and this is the outline of the lung. So you can see this dark area, dark area. So the lungs go almost all the way to the pelvis on a sea turtle, on a healthy sea turtle. Um, here we can see the trachea coming down this dark line. Oh, I don't know how much I touched it. It's very sensitive. Maybe that's it. Um, the trachea bifurcates and goes into the two separate lungs. Um, this big mass of white here and this big mass of white here are actually the, the bone of the plastron, so that's normal. Um, these are the vertebrae with the projections going out, which become the ribs. So all that I'm seeing here right now doesn't look too bad. Um, there is a little thickening in here. Um, this, these are some blood vessels that, um, we're gonna go ahead and look at this side view. These are the two blood vessels that go along into the lungs so that they can pick up the oxygen as the turtle comes up to surface and takes a few breaths. It exchanges air and then the red blood cells can then carry that oxygen back into the body. So on this, what I'm seeing is, if I touch it too closely, see this is kind of a pale area right here. That coincides with that other view that we saw where there was a little bit of, of um, material. I'm gonna point here with the pointer so I don't touch it. We can go back and see if we can see that again. So that coincides with this here um, that we were seeing earlier. Now we're gonna go to the head-on view, and this is a little tough, especially on larger turtles, but right here what we have are what we call end-on blood vessels. Um, we are looking at uh, veins and, and arteries that go into the lungs 
um, but we also have sort of a cloudy nebula looking thing here and here and then there's sort of a, a very pale uh, darkening there. This tells me that we're not done with treatment yet. This turtle still has some consolidation in the lungs and we need to continue. Now, fungal infections in sea turtles can take months of medication to treat. So, all right. Um, Thank you, Dr. Joe. This has been really, really exciting, I think, for both me and our watchers. Um, if people really like seeing our clinic, we do have an encounter for folks that they can purchase when we reopen and you get a behind the scenes tour of our clinic uh, and maybe even get to meet Dr. Joe in person. Or one of our other Amazing. Awesome we have vets. five Bye veterinarians vets. here at the Houston Zoo and they're all as amazing as Dr. Joe. Um, Some we, of them are way more. I, I might way agree. More I might agree. <laughs> um, we also have a, an emergency zoo fund set up for this time. As you can see, just because we're closed, we are not stopping caring for our animals. We continue to care while we're closed. Um, you can visit HoustonZoo.org and contribute to that emergency fund and learn more about sea turtles. You can also rewatch this Facebook Live as well as all the other ones that we've done right there on our website as well and find some fun activities to do about the animals you've learned about. I want to thank you guys for joining us today because I'm very proud of the work we do here at the Houston Zoo. I think um, everybody on staff is excited to be able to help save animals in the wild and to help our population of Houstonians also pre appreciate our native wildlife as well as the exotic animals from other areas of the world. And I know that for me personally, I am excited to get to work with sea turtles, but I get to work with all of the animals at the zoo and like Jackie said, uh, work goes on here whether there are guests coming in and visiting or not. Um, looking forward to tomorrow's Facebook Live, which is going to be utterly amazing. The, um, uh, as Jackie said, it's an utterly good Friday because we're going to be doing a Facebook Live with our otters. Thanks again.